Welcome yourself to Talbot House. Don't dally with the door, Matt. It is a custom to neglect. I hope you had a good time in Pops. Glad to see you made it back in one piece from Wipers. For over four years, the city of Ypres was in the eye of the storm. To conceive a picture of the opposing forces, imagine the salient as a giant bow, drawn back by some titanic archer before the arrow is released. Ypres was the arrowhead. Pooperinga, about eight miles to the west, the feather. Along the shaft passed hundreds of thousands of men, destined to hold the line, or be thrown into a sea of mud in a desperate effort to drive the enemy from the strategically important high ground. Over a quarter of a million of them never returned. Those who did were often shattered in body and soul. If Eep was hell on earth, Poperinger was that first heaven behind hell. When I returned to Poperinger and joined the Bedfords, the town was in a typically 1915 condition. It was an odd, but not an evil, atmosphere which prevailed in Pop. Every week some shells landed somewhere and some lives were lost, but the spirit of light-heartedness was never quenched. There was a canteen in the square run by a splendid Wesleyan chaplain, but beyond this nothing but refugee shops with their eternal display of real eep lace, untrustworthy souvenirs and still more untrustworthy wristwatches. Two of the four chief restaurants were already in full swing. Of course there were estimates everywhere, good, bad, and all of intermediate complexions. The fancies, a great divisional show justly celebrated for Fred Chandler's tenor voice, Dick Holmes's rogue rum, and two Belgian ladies known respectively as Lanolin and Vaseline, who could neither sing nor dance, but at least added a touch of femininity, provided the sole real recreation for officers and men. They lent us their hall on Sunday nights, where, in front of a drop scene painfully reminiscent of the canal bank, Neville preached the gospel of faith and freedom. It was clear an alternative was desirable. It was up to senior chaplain Neville Talbot and his padres to open a place of, of their own, an institutional church providing happiness for the men and, if possible, a hostel for officers going on leave. Chaplains Neville Talbot and Philip Tubby Clayton approached the town major who introduced them to Mr. Kuvut Kamerlink a wealthy banker, who in turn led them to his great empty mansion. They accepted the tenancy joyfully at a rent which was subsequently fixed at 150 francs a month. And now the innkeeper. The man for the job was Reverend Clayton, universally known as Tubby. The least he can say is it was quite a personality. Described as five foot two and a tea bag for his hair. It would be hard to imagine anyone less military looking than Tubby. He often would have been wandering around with two colors of socks and smoke coming out of his pocket because of his pipe. People would say he's on fire again. Concerts and debates showed him at his best, contributing rollicking songs and witty rapperty. Clayton took a genuine interest and care in one's welfare and was able to lift spirits and set you on your feet again. He had a magnetic personality. Although the life and soul of Talbot House, Clayton's ministry was not confined within its walls. From time to time, his customers invited him to repay their calls. He would go slumming, as he put it, to all parts of the front, his faithful old Batman at his heels, and paid regular visits to sections within his parish, inquiring after their well-being ministering to their needs and often holding Holy Communion under intense shellfire. Everywhere his appearance acted like a tonic upon the men. And now, what to call the club? Any thoughts? We had, after many wild suggestions, agreed on some tame and non-committal title, and having contrived six feet of stretched canvas, were busy on the first letter of Church House when Colonel May arrived and announced that the house should be closed there and then if we did not call it Talbot House. Despite Neville's protest, the name was fixed forthwith. 
It had about it the homely flavour of a village inn, and for its deeper note there was the thought of the commemoration of Gilbert Talbot, whose grave and sanctuary wood held the body of one who would have been to English public life what Rupert Brooke began to be to English letters. In the Army Singular's code of the day, tea was Tok, and hence the house became universally known as Tok H. Opening its doors day and night, it welcomed its first guest on the 11th of December 1915, and gradually expanded its reach far beyond the 6th Division to become one of the institutions of the British Army. Through an elaborate iron grilled doorway, I could hear the sound of laughter and music, and pushing through the door, I found myself at once in a different world. It was amazing. I felt like Alice when she stepped through the looking glass. There were soldiers all around me, of course, and army slang in the air, but in stepping across that threshold, I seemed to have left behind me all the depression and weariness of the street. There were walls with paper on them, clean paper too, carpeted stairs, pictures on the walls and vases with flowers in them. 